Okay, hi, so in this video we're going to speak a bit about classification and also how this helps us to study evolution. Okay, so first of all, what is classification? Well, we can really think of it as the grouping of similar organisms. So the grouping, sorry about this handwriting, of similar organisms. Okay, so I've deliberately made this a very sort of vague definition, and that's because there are different ways of classifying organisms. Now, the reason why we want to classify organisms is it makes them easier to study. It makes them easier to study. This is because if you have groups of organisms that all share a lot of similar characteristics, you can make predictions on what unknown species may act like or what they may look like, and it means that you can put them in nice groups and so we can study them more effectively. And so let's have a look at how historically we have grouped together organisms. Now, we group organisms into loads of different groups, and those groups are a hierarchy. So, for example, the most common one, which you've probably heard of, are the kingdoms. Okay, for example, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom. So we've got, for example, the animal kingdom. Okay, they're actually given Latin names, but we're fine just calling them animal and the plant kingdom. Okay, there's also fungi, there's bacteria, and also protoctists, which luckily at the moment you don't need to know. Okay, and so there are loads of different uh, organisms that are found in these groups. For example, we are of course in the animal kingdom, and so is an elephant, and so is a baboon, okay? We're all pretty different to each other, but we all share certain characteristics. So we share characteristics. Characteristics. Okay, and those characteristics are going to be different to organisms which are grouped in the plant kingdom and in the fungi kingdom and so on. For example, animals are defined as being able to move around. So they can move their entire body. Their entire body. We're also um, multicellular organisms as opposed to bacteria. Okay, but moving your entire body, that is a very much animal thing to be able to do. Plants can't do that. They can't move their entire body. They do uh, have the ability to move, though, some of them anyway. But plant cells, they have cell walls. The cells have cell walls. These are just example characteristics, by the way. There are loads, and you don't need to know all of them. But plant cells do have cell walls, and animal cells do not have cell walls. Okay, fungi, they release spores. Okay, they release spores, and that is something that members of the other kingdoms don't do. And so you can see that different characteristics are um, relevant to each kingdom and so organisms are put into those kingdoms depending on those characteristics if you find a new organism that no one's ever seen before and it releases spores it's likely that that's going to go in the fungi kingdom okay and then the groups get smaller so kingdom is an example of a large grouping okay there are loads of different types of animals and then there are loads of different other groups and down the bottom we have a species, which I'm sure you've heard of as well, okay? And an example of a species might be a human being, okay? So humans, we are a specific species. Okay, another example, something like E. coli, which is a bacteria. E. coli is a specific species of bacteria, okay? And so you can see that this is way more specific. If you look at an orangutan, an orangutan is not a human being, but it is an animal. So both us and orangutans fit into the animal kingdom, okay? But we don't both fit into the human species, so you're getting more specific as you go down. E. coli is a bacteria. Now, I haven't written down the bacteria kingdom up here, but there is a bacteria kingdom. So E. coli will not go into any of these kingdoms, but it will go in the bacteria kingdom. However... Something like botulinum, which is also a bacteria, will not go into the same species, but it will be in the same kingdom, okay? So we're just uh, looking at different levels of hierarchy there. Now, there are other levels of hierarchy in between kingdom and species, okay? Those are the phylum, the class, order, family, and genus, but you don't need to remember those, luckily. So all you need to know is kingdoms and species, okay? 
Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Now, something else we need to speak about are evolutionary relationships. So this is one reason why grouping things together, so classification, is so important. Because it means that we can work out um, where we all came from, so where this, where sort of human life came from, where other um, organisms came from in terms of evolution, and we can work out how closely related things are to, uh, to other organisms. For example, when were human beings and orangutans all the same species? If we group things by evolutionary relationships, we can make a good estimate as to how closely related we are. And a very simple diagram might look something like this. So you have the ancestor here. So the common ancestor between us and orangutans. And let's say, for example, that this chain, we get some animal which then turns into different species, okay, and we get some other animals, and then that turns into a load of different species, and one of those is a human being, okay, but a different path, so at this point in time, okay, that common ancestor turned into these two different species, so here and here, okay, and this path is the one where this species turned into other species, and one of these for example, was the orangutan, okay? You can see quite clearly that the human being and the orangutan are different species and we came from sort of different places. But if you go back in time, you can trace that those species, which we came from, both came from a common ancestor, okay? And this is why it's so important to group species. Now, what's very important here is that species can be grouped in different ways. So different groupings or criteria, we'll say, different criteria for grouping the species. And what I mean by that is that a long time ago, species were grouped together by whether they look the same and behave the same. So they, they can be grouped together by looks. They can be grouped together by behavior. For example, if you look at something like a magpie and you look at a pigeon, they're both birds, they both look similar, they are just slightly different colours. So you might think, well, they're really closely related, okay? Even more drastic is if you look at bacteria down a microscope, lots of them look really similar, okay? And you might say that they're really closely related. However, some of them really are very different. And so what they do is different to each other and they behave in a very different way. So you've got to be careful how you group them. And modern day, let me do this in a different color. The modern day groupings are actually mostly done by their DNA. So modern day, okay, we group things together by how closely their DNA matches. Because if your DNA matches, it means that you likely came from the same organism, okay, back um, in time. Because DNA doesn't change from let's say you have 10 chromosomes, it doesn't change to 23 chromosomes, you know, in one go. So it's a gradual thing, um, DNA changing as you turn into different species. And so how close your DNA is related will probably give you a good indication. Okay, there are even other groupings used in the modern day. Uh, I won't go into all of those, but you can have a look at those yourself. It is a very complicated topic, and no one is ever going to agree on the exact best way to group things together. Now, as an example, if you had something like E. coli, which is the bacteria we mentioned earlier, okay, and, um, I don't know, something like yeast. Yeast, okay. They are not overly similar, okay, but they do share some characteristics. For example, they are both single-celled organisms. Now, let's say that we group them together by how they look, they would probably be grouped fairly close together, okay? And so there will be loads of different common ancestors, but this is a really simplified diagram. And then over here, you might have animals, and you might have plants, um, and this would be your diagram if this was based on looks, okay? So, looks. This is, really sim this is a really simplified example, but I just want to demonstrate it. Now, if we were to draw the same two organisms, but based on their DNA, you probably have a common ancestor back here, but their DNA is so drastically different 
that you have all of these different trees, okay, all separating at different points, and this here might be E. coli. Okay, but yeast is a very different organism to E. coli in terms of its DNA. Yeast is actually a way more complicated organism in terms of its genetics, and so that might have actually separated, and you will have a tree that looks something like this. Okay, this is completely inaccurate in terms of um, the real life family tree, but this gives you an example. If you were basing it on looks, E. coli and yeast might be really close together because they're single celled organisms. But if you were grouping them based on their DNA, which is actually more accurate in terms of time, then E. coli and yeast are very, very, very different organisms. They separated from each other millions and millions of years ago, maybe even billions of years ago. And so that is why you would get a tree which looks like this. Okay, so I hope that helped. I just wanted to sort of briefly overview um, the different types of classification and why we use classification in order to group similar organisms. If you do have any questions on this, please do feel free to write a comment in the box below or send me a direct email using the link. But I look forward to seeing you in the next video.